It's Bob McCowan. It's John Shannon. Hello, Robert. On the podcast slash radio program. Available at your favorite podcast location. Generally at the corner of Walk and Don't Walk. Or on Sirius XM channel 167 at 6 p.m. Eastern time every day. Monday to Friday. I guess I can't say every day. Although they may replay them on the weekends. Do you know? No, I don't think they do. They don't, but every weekday, let's say every Thank weekday. You. So here we sit late in February. Um, the weather is still cold here in the, uh, in Southern Ontario. Bleeping cold, bleeping cold. <laughs> and by the way, like, like across the country too, Bob, minus 30 in Edmonton, well, minus 31 in Winnipeg. It is uh, like, it is painfully cold. Well, there's nothing I like better. Well, what I like best is having somebody say, Bob, why don't you go to Florida for seven weeks and cover spring training? But that hasn't Did happened. Did that used to happen? Oh, yes. Was that, oh, yes. Who, who, was that our buddy Millman? No, even before him. I, I was um, uh, 1977, first year. Oh, really? I spent, I spent all of spring training there in 77, 78, and I believe 79. Oh. What was that? You and Gillick and Wally and, and Beeston? Yep. Wow. And everybody stayed at the Ramada Countryside Hotel that first year. And the great part <laughs> about it is all the players, coaches, and media all yeah. stayed at the same hotel. A little Ramada Inn that had one bar. And so at night, yeah, everybody was in the same place. Who was holding cart the most? Well, Gillick? every... Uh, Gillick? No. Yeah. No. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, in a, in a general sense, the coaches and managers were at the bar. The players were off in one corner and the media was in mm -hmm. another corner. Now, I, I can't say the twain shall never meet because the bar mm -hmm. was probably no bigger than this room that I'm sitting in here right now. It was yeah. a little Ramada Inn, you know? Yeah. It was like a motel. Well, and also let's that remember that was one year. That was the seven hundred thousand dollar full salary of the whole Jays roster. Seven, and I believe, and I believe Bill Singer was making a hundred thousand of it, right? That's correct. Yeah. So, so that would seven hundred fifty thousand for for the twenty five man roster. Yep. <laughs> Well, which leads us to where we're going to go. We don't have baseball yeah. right now. We don't know when we're going to have baseball. And uh, if you're a baseball fan, you're like me, you're already starting to miss it because we should be getting fired up. We should be getting ready for spring training games. And we're not. And we don't know if we're going to have any. Um, and at very least, we don't know when. But we're going to talk about all that. And what are the issues in this? Buck Martinez um, is no stranger to this program or to anybody here, the voice of the Blue Jays on television and the former manager and catcher for the club and a guy who has history in these yeah. negotiations. We're going to talk to him when we come back after these messages. McCallum and Shannon back uh, with you. Here we sit late in February at a time when... Um, we probably should be watching pitchers and catchers warming up and guys taken infield and getting ready for spring training baseball games. And that, you know, the, in my mind, it's always been the first renewal of, of spring. Um, you know, many people point to the Masters Golf Tournament, which I do too, to some extent. But for me, it was always when spring training hit in Florida, even though the weather's still cold in the north, you know, baseball was at hand and life couldn't be bad. Well. Baseball is not at hand. Life isn't so great. And I don't have any idea where we're going here. <laughs> Buck Martinez is uh, with us to try and figure this whole thing out. Oh. Well, I, I know based on your history and as a, a former player rep and somebody who was intricately and intimately involved in contract negotiations, um, I suspect you have a, an ongoing level of interest in this beyond just being a broadcaster now, do you? Um, I do, obviously, with my connections with the game in general and with the Players Association particularly. Um, you know, when I broke my leg in 85, I went to New York to actively participate in the negotiations. And, 
you know, I was in uh, Lee McPhail's apartment when we agreed to the contract early in the morning and then uh, hobbled up the stairs at the announcement on my crutches. But I was involved in a lot of the different work stoppages and strikes, what have you, all the negotiations. So, yeah, I pay attention to it. But what gets me and frustrates me more than anything is the fact that they had 43 days where they didn't have a single meeting. Mm-hmm. And now they're just saying, oh, yeah, we're going to meet every day. Well, what happened to those 43 days where you could have been hammering out a lot of the key issues? And even if you didn't agree on the core of the economics, you could hammer out everything else that takes a while to get through. We don't know if they've agreed on the DH. We don't know if they've agreed on the number of options per year. We don't know all those little minutia things that are involved in a CBA. But we certainly know they haven't come together on the CBA. Uh, the uh, collective balance tax, and they haven't come together on arbitration, the two to three year player, and they haven't come together on a minimum salary. And once again, throughout the history of all these negotiations, when they say it's not about the money, it's, it's about the money. About money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I've made this position, I'm intrigued by your perspective on it, that I can't even tell you how many uh, we've been through uh, since 1972, 73. Yeah you know, flood, Messer, Smith, all the, all the things that happened back then that started all this. And, and I've, I've seen every one of them. I've covered every one of them. Um, it's been a lot more peaceful of late, but we have lots of history in this. And I always felt, Buck, as if I, I, we, on the outside looking in, could identify the key points, the key stumbling blocks, the things that were going to be problematic. Yeah, there were a whole bunch of little things, but they would fall into place. But this was the this was the the key thing. I don't know what the I don't know what the stumbling block is this year. Yeah, I, I'm not saying there isn't one. There there may be a whole bunch of them. But what's the big issue in your well, mind? You know, and I'm with you. And it was easy to identify free agency. It was easy to identify arbitration. Easy to identify pension contribution. Those were hard and fast things that everybody could understand and the players were united in defending those aspects of the CBA. But now it's a little bit murky and especially murky to the general public and the fan base because you're arguing over a minimum salary of 575 or 775 where the common man's uh, trying to get $60,000 a year in a regular job and trying to figure out how he can pay for $5 a gallon gas. And it's mm-hmm. hard for the fan to understand that, but it's, it's, it's murky. There's no question about it. The collective bargaining tax affects basically two teams last year. And at the most four teams over the course of a regular season, when they go over that plateau of spending and have a tax that's punitive for going over that plateau. So it doesn't affect a lot of people in the game. So what th- this, is, this has been consistent over the history What we have here is the owners trying to police the owners once again, where the (laughs) majority of the owners are trying to put a cap on the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Padres and the Red Sox to make sure they don't outspend everybody because they have deeper pockets. But as the players now, and I have a hard time with the player pool. They're trying to have a bonus pool for the two to three year player If you're not a two plus player that goes to arbitration, they're trying to create a pool. What's that do for the game? When I'm standing at second base thinking, I need to score this run so I can be in the top 10% of the run scored pool, it individualizes the game even more than it has. So now you're going to have all these two to three year service time players worried about their statistics more than ever because they're trying to get part of that bonus pool. I don't like the creation of that bonus pool. What I would like to see if they want to worry about the younger players is elevate the percentage of two to three year players that can have arbitration, the so-called super twos, which is 22% now, bump it up to 40%. And it's still going to be the prime 40% players of that two to three year service time group. So I I don't like the, the pool bonus pool. I think that individualizes the game even more than it already is. Buck, you talked about uh, the 43 days without talking. Do you think that there was uh, something conniving on either side to say, don't worry, the other side will cave? Or was it a classic game of chicken? Well, John, we have a situation here where 
There is no player involved in the major leagues right now that's ever been through a work stoppage. Right. So they don't know what it's like. They've never been through it. And of course, I went through the 81 strike, which was the strike of all strikes and caused us 50 days of not playing baseball. But the, I think there's only about three or four owners that have ever been through a labor negotiations in the past. Mm -hmm. It's uh, contentious. You know, how Steinbrenner got it passed down. Jerry Reinsdorf has been through a lot of these things in the past, but I don't think he's actively involved in the labor negotiation board. But uh, a lot of new owners are involved in this, and I don't know. I think you're right, John. I think it was like, well, you know, the, the players are making so much money, they're not going to stand up for anybody. Well, I don't know if that's the case or not. I well, how this works. I wonder how this, how does this sit with the public who have, you know, are going through two years of a, of a COVID pandemic. What do you think? I don't want to hear a thing about it. They right. want baseball. They don't care what you guys are fired. I, I want to see my team on the spring. And Bob, you made a great point this time of the year. And we see a lot of Canadians down here already. And they come down here and they're trying to get into the uh, atmosphere of spring and to the weather and everything else. They want to see baseball. And, you know, fans from all of the upper Midwest, from the West Coast, everybody goes to Arizona and Florida to see baseball this time of the year mm -hmm. because it is the right of spring and it means that summer is coming and it's a great time. And they don't care about TV rights and revenues and all that stuff. They want baseball. And I think given what we've all been through for the last two years, the industry would make a huge mistake if they interrupt any of the regular season games. You are right, of course, in um, saying that none of the players have been through a work stoppage, that most of the owners have not been through a work stoppage. But I have wondered aloud um, about this. Neither the head of the Players Association nor the commissioner have been through a work stoppage in their current roles. Right. And invariably they hold some level of power we we can sit here and say that the commissioner you know works for the owners and therefore does their bidding and we can sit here and say well the head of the players association works for the players and they basically tell him what to do but that's theoretical um they are key they are pivotal players in this exercise and i wonder whether you think that either one of them or both of them are trying to exercise their muscle in this first opportunity that they have had to do so. Yeah, that's a great point. And we have seen the commissioner exercise his muscle in other areas leading up to this. Yes, when we have. He implemented some of the rules and he moved the all-star game from Atlanta almost single-handedly. He's done a lot of things to put his fingerprints on this game. And I think you're right. You might be uh, right on the money with that. Uh, as far as the Players Association, Tony Clark has been involved for a long time, and they have a general counsel now in Bruce Meyer who has worked in all four major sports, and he's been involved in sports negotiations for a long time. He actually worked with Don Fear at the NHL Players Association as well. So he has a history of this. But when I go back to my time with the Players Association, we had Marvin Miller, we had Dick Moss, we had Gene Orson, we had Don Fear, we had Steve Fear, we had an entire staff of legal representatives that would present everything to the players and make recommendations to the players. And as always has been the case, the players are the ones that ultimately make the decision. Now there are, I believe, there are 10 players on the executive committee. Seven of those players are represented by Scott Boris. So they have a guy that's pushing the buttons behind the scenes as well. So, you know, we had in, in 81, we had a meeting at the LA Air Airport, LAX Airport, in the middle of the strike, in the 45th, 46th day of the strike. And there was 300 players there. And it was very, very contentious. And players were getting paid. There were some players that got paid during the strike. And they had leverage because of who they were. So they negotiated strike clauses in their contract. And some of the players at the meeting were very upset because most of us hadn't received a dime since the strike began. But several players, and I think Reggie Smith was one of them that stood up and says, listen, every one of us in this room would have done the same thing had we had the leverage that these players had. 
And we all kind of got together at that meeting and kind of really made everybody understand how united we were as a union. And that to me, those meetings when we had two and 300 players mm -hmm. at a meeting and everybody agreed to stay together, that's what forced the end of that strike, which lasted, I believe, 52, 53 days. One of the other things that I, I wonder about, and I, I think you can address this, the discrepancy between the rookie player on a minimum salary and the player who is um, at the top of the food chain has never been wider by mathematical standards. Right. Um, look, I'm going to, you know, when you were, when you were a young player in the seventies, um, you know, and I'm trying to hypothesize numbers, but hundred thousand dollar player was like the top of a player. I remember sure. when I started sure. making a hundred thousand dollars and everybody went, Oh my God, he's making a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. But what was the minimum then? 15. Ten? Okay. 15. Yeah. So you're talking about six or seven times what right. the minimum player was making today. <laughs> It is 40 times, 50 times as much. Right. How much of a factor do you think that is in all of this? It's huge. And, and there's, there's a number that's been quoted, and I, I think it's pretty accurate that over the last couple of years, 63% of the players in the major leagues are zero to three service time players. Mm -hmm. So those players are making the minimum, most of them, and for people that don't understand, the minimum works this way. You, you have a great year, uh, and I'll use a, a regular player, uh, say Kevin Pillar, plays every day, nice player, has a good career. He makes a minimum 500000 Well, he's going to get a contract offer for the next year of $502,000. He's going to get a $2,000 raise, and they're going to do that until he hits arbitration. So those first three years, you're making just over the minimum. And I will say the general class of zero to three players will make somewhere within $100,000 of the minimum. They might give a particular player like a Tony Fernandez who came up as a rookie and was phenomenal in his rookie season. They might give him an extra $20,000. But majority of those players are just going to get cost of living raises. That's it. So a lot of the players in the major leagues are making just over the minimum for the first three years. And the, the unintended consequences of that is that the Kevin Pilars with eight, nine, 10 years of service are not getting paid what they should be getting paid. They're taking two and $3 million contracts when indeed they worked their way up to five and $6 million contracts. But now they're restricted free agents because of all of the mm -hmm. things that are tied to free agency. They don't receive a qualifying offer. They're on the free agent market with a lot of other veteran players that are eight to 10 year service players that help championship teams win pennants. But now they're making too much money and the clubs will pay that zero to three player 600,000. Well, they've eliminated, they essentially have eliminated the middle class. Yes. Right. They have. And, and, um, that's happening in every pro sport because of this. This it's type exactly of thing. what's happening yes. in every sport. And when you when you think about the championship teams, and I'll use the Atlanta Braves as a perfect example. When you look at the players they picked up in the middle of the season, the Rosarios and those players that came over, they're the veteran players that got them over the hump and helped sure. them get over the injuries that they suffered during the course of the season and allowed them to win the World Series because Alex Antapos was able to pay them their salaries for the rest of the year. Now they're, they're gone. They're not going to be there anymore, but they helped them win because of their experience and the fact that they were seven, eight, nine year experienced major league players that they picked up mid season. Yeah. The, the other part of that buck is, and, and we'll, we'll take the Pilar example a little farther is when you talk about uh, $500,000 in his first year of major league baseball, that wasn't his first year of professional baseball, though, was it? I mean, th that's the one thing about that's the one thing about this sport than any other, is what it takes for you from the day you get drafted to the day you make your major league debut can be three six years, years, four years, six years. Six it, years. it can be, and all of a sudden, you're, you're not 21 or 22; you're 26. 
And that's, that's the one thing that I, I think a lot of people don't understand in this sport, particularly every other sport, teenagers can make big dollars quicker right than they can in baseball. Yes. No question. And Kevin Pillar would have signed for a thousand dollars. That was his signing bonus. Then he would have gone to a ball and made $500 a month for five months. Not paid in the off season, not paid during spring training. And yes, he chose the career and he knew sure. what was involved. And yeah, he lived five to a, a room. Guy slept on air mattresses and all that. That's what you did to get through the minor leagues. But when you think about the average length of a career for a guy that makes one day of service in the major leagues is probably under four years. No. So he's going to make minimum salary for four years and be out of the game. And that's why, you know, it's hard for the fan to understand, well, you know, he's making half a million dollars. Well, he's not going to make a half a million dollars the rest of his life. He's going to make it for three or four years, and then he's going to have to jump from team to team in the hope that there's a team right. like the Braves that recognizes his experience level is valuable to his team and might make four or five million dollars in a year. Could certainly it's a nomadic life if you look at it that way. Oh, I mean, absolutely. when you think about it, life in a suitcase, right? Yep. And just like you started, you finish up the way you started. That's that's right. Well, not five, you know, you're not getting I mean, five there's, five there's guys. Percentage. I mean, obviously oh, sure. there's a percentage of guys, and you know, we can look at the contracts and and you look no farther than Robbie Ray and Marcus Simeon and Corey Seeger mm -hmm. and those phenomenal contracts they signed this off season. They're set for life, and their kids are set for life. And their kids, kids are set for life because they're making three and four hundred thousand, or throughout a hundred million dollars a year. But that's not the case. The majority of the players have to uh, be very prudent with the money they earn. On that point, how important is it for a guy like Max Scherzer to be part of the negotiation? I think it's huge. I think it uh, sends a great message, and he's committed. I mean, you guys have probably been around Max Scherzer. He's one of the most special baseball superstars I've ever been around. Very bright, very articulate. He's a math major. He's a whiz with uh, numbers, and he loves baseball. And you can see it when he's on the field. He loves to compete, and he takes pride in leaving this game the way it was presented to him when he got here. And Andrew Miller's doing the same thing. Marcus Simeon's involved, and these are good people, and they want what's best for the game. I know deep down inside they're concerned about the game and the fans because the fans are the lifeblood of this game. And we have to remember the fans because baseball is losing popularity dramatically. We know about the pace of the game. We know about the young fans, this interest in the game because it's slow, it's boring. There are three outcomes and everybody doesn't understand, you know, there's a pitching matchup and an opener's pitching against Bob Gibson. Well, what happened to the Warren Spahn and Sandy Koufax? What happened to those <laughs> matchups? We don't see those often anymore. And mm, that nope. is the mistake baseball is making. With Buck Martinez, all right, I'm going to throw something at you and, and understand I, I'm just intrigued by your response to this. It's, it's not a, something I believe in. It's not even a suggestion. But on the owner's side, they live with revenue sharing. On a, on a variety of levels uh -huh. in terms of overall revenue, television revenue, even attendance revenues, which are shared with teams that don't do as well attendance wise, which allows a team like the Pittsburgh Pirates to be futile on the field year after year after year, but still make money. Right. Right. So that exists on that side of the equation. And I'm not here to judge the, the rightness or wrongness of that. You have players making $35 million a year and others making $500,000 a year. Should there be any responsibility within the players, within the players association to share that pool of revenue? Or is that contrary to any, you know, democratic belief you may have in the system? Because right. I know it's a wild idea, but I, I, what do you think of that? It's a very interesting idea. And I think, and I'm not up to date on the numbers, but when Marvin Miller was talking to us about our situation before free agency, he was talking about how much money the owners made and how much money we were getting as a portion of 
their revenues. And it was a small percentage. When free agency came in in 1976, that percentage grew in the players' favor, obviously, because now they understood there was more money and, and the revenues in baseball are growing upwards of $11 billion. Mm -hmm. Player salaries have gone down for four straight years. The average salary has gone down. Once again, utilizing the younger player, eliminating the middle class, that does Correct. all of those things. But what an interesting proposal you make. Now, it's contrary to the way we think. You perform well, you get rewarded. You're it's the socialism. Elite. Exactly. You're the elite. And, and I, think, I think it would be a mistake to go down that path because just because Max Scherzer is good doesn't mean that the guy with the 5-6 ERA should make some of Max Scherzer's money. Max Scherzer <laughs> makes money because he wins games for the team. And Max Scherzer pitches in the postseason. And Kevin Kershaw and then Clayton Kershaw does it as well. And those guys are getting paid because they win big games. And they've done it over the years. Now, Corey Seager got $330 million. Do I think he's that kind of player? No. But he performed in the biggest stage for the Dodgers and won the World Series at a premium position. And he's a left-handed bat. So the Rangers needed a premium player at a left-handed position shortstop. So he hit the jackpot. They're in a new ballpark. Their revenues are great. But to answer your question, I know I've kind of gone around it. I don't think that would work because the nature of the game, we're out there to compete, to be the best, and the rewards are there for the best. I don't disagree with you, but let me, let me take it one step further. And again, I'm throwing this out there. I don't necessarily believe in it. I understand why it won't happen. It's a great conversation. It's it's an interesting conversation. You, you met my co-host Carl Marx, didn't you? Well, <laughs> it, but it is interesting. But but let me tell you how I think it might be interesting. If Buck Martinez is the head of the Players Association, and he walked in with his briefcase in hand and opened it up on the desk in front of the commissioner and said, "All right, here's what we're prepared to do. We believe that the players at the bottom of the food chain." are underpaid we want to see it go from 550 to 775 and here's what we're going to do to um this is how much we believe in it as an association we're going to assign 10 percent of every player's salary at the top echelon of um, the economic scale to a shared pool which will be disseminated that money will be disseminated to players based on economics alone, not based on ability, not based on anything, but we're essentially going to say, we're going to raise the minimum, at least some percentage, um, just as a demonstration of how important we think this is. If you presented that, do you based think- Based on service time and you would be increased on service time? I don't know. I, I'm I'm hypothesizing completely. I haven't thought it what through. Would you, what, I'm simply what, what saying would you, the rich are going to give something to the poor because the essence of the battle here is that the the minimum salary player needs to make more. We'll do this. Will you match us at least? That's a good point. When you say, okay, now we're both can contribute to elevating the 63% zero to three class. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. That's a very interesting point. The, the, I the question I yeah, the question I would have Buck about it, Buck, is is uh, you, you're going to have a small percentage, not a lot, but you're going to have some players that once they get to the major leagues and they finally made it, and and they they get part of that pool, what would their incentive to be to be better than? What would I mean? Oh, I've made it. And well, that, it, that, that well, would but, be the downside. Yeah, because the apple that. is bigger upstairs when you continue to be an all-star, continue to win penance and everything else, it's going to grow and grow and grow as you become better and better, more of a star. And, and the stars are always going to be rewarded in this game. It's been the case forever. Uh, Nolan Ryan went in and, and negotiated a contract with the Houston Astros when they asked him, what do you want in this contract negotiations? He said, I want to make a million dollars, meaning that a collective contract a million dollars over the course of the contract they yeah. said done they paid him a million dollars a year for five years <laughs> so well. I mean, the money is there there's no question about it and the stars are always going to make their money because that's the attraction to the ballpark 
People are going to come to Rogers Center for years and years to watch Vladdy and Bo. Yep. No question about it. And they're going to have to pay them. And that's coming up. But I always propose something, and I talked this to Marvin Miller years ago, to make it an incentive-based reward. If you make the major league roster 26 man, everybody makes the same amount of money. And then according to the number of wins, you get rewarded for every team win. And then you get rewarded for every individual win. Pitcher gets so much for a win. Player gets so much for an RBI. Player gets more for a run scored. Make it team-based incentives where everybody starts out making $5 million. You're going to make $5 million this year if you make the Toronto Blue Jays. And then for every win, we will give you an extra $250,000. And that's going to motivate the teams to be winners. And that's also going to motivate the bottom teams to push and become winners as well, mm -hmm. because yeah. you're going to drag the whole industry up. You but know who wouldn't like that? Scott Boris. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, follow the money. <laughs> well, that's right. I, I know right. in response to that, Buck, I mean, I know I've told this story several times in the past, but David Stern, the former commissioner in the NBA, was a guest on my show during a, a lockout. And he, uh, I, it's my favorite quote of everybody I've talked to over the years. Stern said, he said, Bob, we've got $5.2 billion that we're prepared to give the players in salaries. We don't care how they get it. You can give it all to Michael Jordan. You can half to Michael Jordan. You can split it equally among every player. We don't care. All we are telling them is we got $5.2 billion and not a penny more. And I thought that was the most brilliant strategy maybe not for the negotiations but from a public perspective was to say we don't care who makes what right yeah we now, that's a great point and i think baseball's in the same boat they're going to keep their money they deserve to keep their money they're the owners they're the ones that are footing the bill they they back the teams they put a lot of money into it they deserve to make the biggest chunk of money and players will argue, well, we're the game. Well, you know what? You are the game. People come to watch the players, no question about it. Yeah, you're but, the game today, but tomorrow you may not be. Exactly. And you might mm -hmm. make 45% of the total revenues. And if who's to argue with that? And then you have to decide how you want to divvy it up. And that's where it becomes interesting. But that's the same argument that's been going on forever. It's money. Sure it is. There's yeah. a pot of the owner's money and a pot of players' money. How do you divide it up? It's arbitration. It's free agency. Free agency, people forget. Free agency came about as a one and one deal. Mm -hmm. It was ruled in court. You play one year, you're a free agent. Marvin Miller said, no, we don't want to do that. We'll flood the market with free agents. And that'll keep the salaries down. And he decided six years was good. And I think six years is the right. I wouldn't change six years. I think it's perfect. I like the arbitration fact. I think if you... The lottery is tanking is an issue. There's no question about it. And Correct. that's something we haven't talked about. Tanking is an issue. You've got to figure out a way to incentivize teams to push hard all throughout the season. Whether you have a floor, if you have a salary floor, you're going to get a salary ceiling too. And the players don't want a salary cap, obviously. Right. But, you know, baseball is uh, is a unique game in that uh, it's still players are treated the best. Uh, they get guaranteed contracts and you make a lot of money and um, it's still a great game. And I just hope that this particular negotiations team doesn't screw it up. <laughs> well, so far, they're not doing much of anything. So we don't know whether they're screwing it up or or just not talking, although they they say they are talking now. Yeah. Uh, we got to take a break. We're going to come back with more. Buck Martinez is with us. We'll be back after these messages. Bob McCown, John Shannon, Buck Martinez is with us from Florida, as per usual. Well, let's get off of this. Uh, okay, can I ask one more question about that, Bob? Just, just yeah, to, sure. Um, you talked early on, Buck, about um, the owners not being happy with each other at times and, and this being a way to police them. Right. You know darn well. You know darn well. I'm going to take. You know the guys that own the Phillies are not happy with the guys that own the Pirates, because they're not pulling their weight. They're just taking revenue sharing, and that's life. Right. Um, and everybody's concerned about Steve Cohen. 
yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is, is that going to change? Can that change? And does and does that mean that you're going to see owners crack before players? Um, that's possible. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of new owners that have just put new money into this game. And they've uh, put a lot of money and teams have sold for billions of dollars recently when Steinbrenner's paid, what, $7 million for the Yankees and the Blue Jays cost eleven, And, you know, that's... Uh, it was uh, very, very reasonable to own a team. And then the commissioner, of course, made that statement that uh, he wished he had never said, where it's bad investment if you own a baseball team. <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, a situation where I think that, you know, the owners are concerned about it. And there's still restrictions. I mean, you know, the salary cap, you go over the threshold, you have to pay tax. I think what they should do is eliminate any draft choice compensation for free agents that would make everybody on an equal basis where you can have a, a team like the pirates can sign somebody without giving up a draft choice which they're reluctant to do and and still get into the free agent competition as well but uh, i think people are concerned about steve cohen and his deep pockets and what he's going to do he already has been very active before the lockout and you know he wants to win and he wants to fight the yankees and he wants to battle for that big money in New York and um, no telling what he's liable to do. And I think that's why the owners are sticking close to the collective balance tax because they don't want some right. rogue owner going off and spending $300 million on the team. But isn't, but isn't that the, the system that currently exists an incentive to tank because you're still, you, you can tank. Absolutely. You're still going to make, you're, you're still going to make your money. Yeah. No, I, I think, too, when, you know, and the teams value the draft picks so much now that I think you should take away the worst team getting the first pick. And they've tried to address that a little bit with the lottery draft. But I think it should be the reverse order. And we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. The first 10 teams that have the best 10 record, they get the second 10 picks in the draft. The second 10 teams get the first 10 picks because they almost made it to the playoffs. Right. And they pushed hard to the end, and they should be rewarded for their efforts over the course of the summer. The last 10 teams get the last 10 picks every year. You finish the last 10, you get the last 10 picks of the 30 draft picks in the round. Well, that's that's theoretically nice, but um, I'm not sure that <laughs> changes the manipulation factor that exists in baseball. I mean, I mean, well, let me throw another one at you. I'll that tell you accelerates what. mediocrity. <laughs> Yeah, I just it, don't know that they – I don't think the Pittsburgh Pirates would change their philosophy. Well, I and mean, they've got a small market. They've got a – you know, they were one of the premier teams in baseball for many sure years. They oh, you know, I know. The Clemente years in the 70s and then the Bonds and Van Slyke and Bonilla years in the 90s and all Well, so that. are the Kansas City Royals. Yeah. But, but they've, they've operated not completely dissimilarly to the Pirates of late. But they've won a World Series in the 2015s, and they've been, you know, they've competed yeah. like, like the Tampa Bay. I know. Ray. Well, and Tampa Bay is, an, I, you know, I was going to cite Tampa Bay and to some extent the Oakland A's. You know, the Oakland A's are a classic example of a, a franchise that, you know, as long as Billy Bean has been there, even before Billy Bean was, was, has been there, they consider themselves a small market team. The owner doesn't, isn't going to spend too much money. They're on a budget, which brought us to um, money, ball, right? So they're kind they of in that a championship. Mix. They compete, but they oh, compete. Yeah. They compete with a small budget. But Tampa, they won a championship. Tampa yeah. and is Tampa's <laughs> the team that spends low and has a high success rate and have been able to do it consistently over the last how many years? But they still haven't won. They still nope. haven't brought home the championship because they don't have a Max Scherzer. And they don't have right. a clean Kershaw. They traded those Blake Snells and David Prices and those Matt, those pitchers that win in the postseason. They traded those guys away to compete. And it's the way they operate. And yeah, it's nice. They're always in contention, but they don't have that horse to win two games in a postseason series. Yeah, but if you're sitting, if you're a fan, if you want to be a fan of a team and you're sitting at home principally and watching games on television, you want to be a fan of the Kansas City Royals, Pittsburgh Pirates, or the Tampa Bay Rays. Because I'll tell you what, the more wins, the better over the course of the year. And yeah, I might be disappointed at the end, but Tampa Bay's probably going to win 90 games every year. Maybe a lot more than that. They don't reap the rewards at the turnstiles. 
Of well, course and, they and don't, to, but that's the market. That, to that you know? point, to that point, what teams are we talking about over the last two or three years more than any others that are going to move? Oakland and Tampa. Never been. Yeah. Of course. I mean, so and, and I mean, here, it, here's another thing that's all in the under the surface of all these negotiations: expansion. You know they can get two billion dollars for an expansion fee, and you know who's that getting that all, money. What's that? Who's getting that money? The owners. The owners. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to have four billion dollars to divide among the thirty existing owners, and they're going to expand. And that's you know, and it, it, thirty-two teams is better than thirty for divisional races and league races and playoffs and everything else. And they're waiting for that two billion dollar price tag to expand, and that's free money, and that's coming. And I know, that's, it's- and that's why too, I think they're reluctant to move Oakland or Tampa Bay to Montreal or Charlotte or Las Vegas or Nashville right. because they p- perceive those cities to be expansion cities. Just what I was going to ask you, like, where, where do you think they wind up going? Well, I didn't, I mean, you, you named four or five cities there. Las Vegas, Nashville, Charlotte, Montreal. Would you, you know. w- w- do you have a perception of who might be fa- the favorite? Nashville and Las Vegas, I would think. Nashville's, Nashville's not that big. North America. Na- Na- Nashville's like 700,000 people, Buck. It's yeah, not very you big. Know what? It's booming. Everybody yeah. wants to live there. And yeah. everybody is going there. It's a music hotbed. It's got a lot of things that baseball wants to be involved with. And I think Nashville it- is going to be there with Las Vegas. The, the, the interesting thing about it is, so it, it, co- it, it you know, it cost me two billion dollars to buy a team, and then it's going to ne- cost me another seven hundred million to a billion dollars to build a stadium. Yeah, I mean, my goodness gracious, that's I mean, isn't it? It's at three, almost three billion dollars. It's almost cost prohibitive. Brian, look at the look at the Ram Stadium that they just built. What did that cost? Three billion dollars? Five point five. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> So there's money in the game, John. There's money in the game. <laughs> well, and again, are we going to argue the validity of spending that mo- that amount of money? I mean, at this point, you know, it's a ridiculous. It seems like a ridiculous, un- unrecoverable amount, but clearly yeah. it isn't. Yeah. Because if it was unrecoverable, they, they wouldn't, wouldn't do it. them. That's they right. They wouldn't do it. Exactly and, right. And if it was didn't make sense to sign Max Scherzer to forty million dollar contract a year, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't yeah. do it. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left here. Do you have anything else you want to interrupt with here? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I'll, I'll, Bob, I'll let you interrupt. Well, I want to tap into this, and I mean, I know there's no baseball going on, and the Blue Jays can't uh, address any of their needs until baseball resumes, but there's going to be a flurry of activity. Boy, oh boy. Yep. Huh? Well, the later it starts, the busier it's going to be. Well, a lot of teams got a lot of questions that are going to have to answer. A lot of players are looking for jobs. If if you're the Toronto Blue Jays, what is the most important need for them? If they wind up being able to only do one thing, do they need a second baseman, a third baseman, a starting pitcher? What do they need? A third baseman. Third, third baseman is the key. A switch hitting third baseman that plays in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Very subtle. Well, Very what do you subtle. think the odds are of, of uh, the former head of the Indians prying that guy away from the new head of the Indians? Guardians. Uh, the Guardians, Jays. please. Come on. Sorry. Yes, the Guardians now. Guardians. The, uh, the Blue Jays have one of the deepest and most talented farm systems in all of baseball, with many players on the cusp of being major league players, plus a host of catching prospects, a host of infield prospects, with two of the best infielders right now and Vladdy and Bo in the mix, established major leaguers. So they have plenty of players to make a deal. And I think Cleveland needs players. And, you know, are they going to win with Jose Ramirez this year? Probably not. Hmm. Can they win with uh, pitching prospects, uh, three or four infield prospects and an outfield prospects and a catching prospect? Down the road, they will. Not mm-hmm. unlike what they did when they uh, made the trade uh, with Cliff Lee. 
They traded Cliff Lee and got a big return for that, turned them into a championship team. So yeah, there's there's a lot of possibilities. But I think the Blue Jays have the players, they have the talent level in the minor leagues and in the major leagues to make a deal. Mm-hmm. You remember they got four good outfielders too. And yeah. Uh, yeah. they got some good players. They got some guys they can't even afford to sign again. That's, that's, that's going to be part of the issue too, right? Yeah. Well, uh, and, and I've gone down this road before and I've had nothing but arguments from baseball people. I probably, I may have said it to you too. I think a guy who's kind of flying under the radar right now that I think they're going to have to trade and probably Guriel? should do it now. Hmm? Guriel or T- yeah. Teoscar. Hernandez. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, it's not that I don't like Teoscar. I like him a lot, but you got two infielders who are going to get a crap load of money and they are integral to the future of the franchise. And you have no real replacements for them as we sit here today. Nothing that's even close to comparable. Teoscar Hernandez. I argue there's a guy that's very interesting in Aravis Martinez. Could be. Mm-hmm. I, I think you're right, but we don't know. Yeah, now, we know that, what these two guys are. We know what these two guys are. We know her, uh, uh, Teoscar had a great year last year and has He's been in Jose Bautista. Bautista. He has. And he has been an improving player every year he's been here. He was ju- he was just a guy like Bautista, just a guy when they got him. And he has become better and better and better. But he's going to be too expensive. And he's not that. homegrown. There's that too. Out of your homegrown, mm-hmm. which should be important, and I think will be important because you want to build a legacy of homegrown products, and they're the ones that are going to mold your personality as an organization. They're the ones that are going to run the clubhouse. They're the ones that are going to bring in the other players. Those are the guys that you're building right. on. No question about it. So <laughs> you move Hernandez if you can. Now, you're not going to get – you You want value for him. Oh, no, no. You're going to – it's going to take Teoscar or Guriel, Nate Pearson maybe, Jordan Groshans, uh Alejandro Kirk, it's going to take five or six players that are in the major leagues or on the cusp of the major leagues to get Jose Ramirez. Yeah. But you do it. Hey, uh, where's Freddie? Fre- you, you, oh, yeah. Freddie I think you have to. I think he'll stay in Atlanta. Freddie will? He's an Atlanta guy. I don't think he's a big city I agree. guy. I think he'll stay there. Well, and he doesn't, he's not a fit in Toronto. No. 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 We got a first baseman. Yeah. And you know what? He's getting better and better. And, and you're not going to move him back to third. That would be no, 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 no. Yeah. No, you need a legitimate third baseman. I think uh, Espinal and Vigio can handle second because you have so much offense at first and short. Right. Exactly. And then you need a third baseman. And, yeah, shoot for the moon is Ramirez. Something less than that is something they're going to have to address. But I think that's the number one priority for the Blue Jays is to address third base. Uh, Bucko, we wish we were talking baseball instead of the theories <laughs> of baseball. I'll be back when we start. <laughs> <laughs> or three foot putt. Uh, I'm afraid. How, I'm afraid of how punch. long we may have to wait, <laughs> if that's the criterion. Uh, but uh, you know what? We will do that when when they decide to settle this whole thing. Whether it's tomorrow, next week, or next month, uh, we'll uh, we'll come back and you know what? We'll we'll get your assessment on what they wound up doing and whether it was worth whatever yeah. the the price in terms of time is. Let's hope it's quick. Absolutely, I look forward to it. Thanks, Bucko. Great to see All you, right. as always. Great evening. Bye for now. Buck Martinez, back after these messages. Well, we're almost done. Our thanks to Buck Martinez for joining us, and I, I, I quite enjoyed that conversation. I mean, I think there were some very interesting scenarios that came out of that. Um, but we thank Buck, as always, for uh, being with us. And interestingly enough, I don't recall you voicing an opinion on the Hernandez situation. And I have voiced on a couple of occasions, the notion of, I think you have to trade Hernandez have to, because you won't be able to afford him um, when the two infielders are ready to sign their deal. And you got a center fielder making $25 million and God knows who else is going to need a raise. What do you think about the notion of trading Hernandez now? Well, well, we know somebody has to go. Um, and, and the key thing is, and and Buck did talk about it there in order to get exactly what you want at third base, 
you know, maybe a guy like Hernandez does make sense. Uh, in, in, and then who is it? Guriel plays right field. Can you live with Guriel playing right field? That, that, Cause that, that, that's part of the equation, isn't it? I mean, so you get rid of Hernandez, get rid of his dollars, but who goes to right field? Well, we know Guriel's got a pretty good arm. Yeah. So I don't think that him playing right field is going to be now every once in a while, he's a stone finger, but he's gotten better. Okay. I have no issue with Guriel going to right field, but I, you know, to be mm. honest with you, John, until this moment, I hadn't thought about it. Well, but you, you do have to replace him. I mean, it's, it's, you're well, not just going to put out. Yes. So yeah. So you have to figure out what's going to go in there and, and play who's going to go in there and play that position. And look at from me, an, if you're, you're, and you're giving up 30 home runs and a hundred plus RBIs. It's not G- like you're Gur- giving, you know, you're, you're giving away or you're moving a really good player one you'd like to keep but you also can't have a 250 million dollar payroll we don't think well unless that's sort uh, of the number the ownership that you're looking decide, at. unless the ownership decides you can't I mean, that's the other thing about this is that when you when you do the mathematics and you, you always used to quote beast and saying i can make my numbers do anything i want yeah jump up and do the jig yeah so but i but the, the, the hernandez one makes sense because i I mean, in giving him up, you're going to be able to get more back because you're going to need to get something back. And hopefully that is that third base. And so I, I'm, I'm fully on board with it. I can accept that. Well, and with the economics of today, you do two things. You pay a couple of guys a whole lot of money who are great. Yeah. And then you pay a whole bunch of guys almost nothing who you hope are going to be great. And let's That's face it, the, the, bar's been, the bar's been set because of what they paid Springer. They, the bar's been set. So they're going to have to, and then the other two guys are going to get a ton of money, right? Well, it, it's, I think it's probably going to be close to $70 million between them. Might That's the more. number that I have in my head. Look, look what Texas paid for those players. Look exactly. What Texas paid. Exactly. Ooh. We got to get out of here. Uh, that'll do it for us, for uh, John Shannon, Bob McCowan. We uh, thank you for watching or listening as the case may be, and we'll uh, see you next week. Goodbye, everybody.